we are often told, God loves you. But what does that really mean? That some impersonal force galaxies away may consider you from time to time? Or that you are a single drop in a vast ocean of humanity and God cares for all of it? There are billions of lives, billions of stories. Can we really believe he has great destinies planned for all of them? Surely the ruler of the universe has more important affairs than to notice the needs of one singular individual. But hear this, nothing could be further from the truth. When God says, I love you, it means that he crafted every detail of your being. Your every feature is his perfect design. His mind perceives your worries and your thoughts. His heart is broken by your pain. You are his child, created in his image. Your value exceeds all the riches of earth. Your worth extends beyond the stars. And though you may be unaware, he's carefully constructing the events of your life to build his kingdom. If you are willing, he can and will achieve wonders through your hands. It is the deepest passion, the most meaningful promise. It is your security, your hope, and your future. It is the truth beyond doubt. God loves you. I know that some people, you know, I, I, I've even heard criticism of pastors who preach just the God loves you kind of sermons and doesn't go deep into the word. How many of you know that we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse, so we do go deep into the word? But if we're going to go chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you are going to run into passages where God says, I love you. So we're going to talk about it. Amen. It's not shallow. It's what's next. Because that's what we've been studying. We've been studying uh, Exodus. And we've learned a lot. We've learned that the tabernacle, every part of it, from its furniture to how it's laid out, every part, even the colors, all mean something. They are all pictures or illustrations that help us understand our relationship with the Holy God in some aspect. And everything seems to connect. I mean, when we learned that the colors, red, purple, and blue, when we, we learned that those colors are symbolic in such a way that just blows your doors off, because blue is a pure primary color, red is a pure color, primary color but when you take a hundred percent blue and a hundred percent red and you combine them at the same time you get purple and purple is the royal color and we learned that blue represents god and red represents man and that's a picture of jesus who claimed to be the god man 100 percent god and 100 percent man at the same time in fact that wasn't even fully understood until it was revealed by God through the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. As the New Testament was being written, they were going, well, who is Jesus? Who is the Messiah? And they looked back into the Old Testament and went, wow, it all seems to fit. It's almost like somebody planned this. I mean, it's, it's so detailed. It's right down to the colors. And that goes for what the priests wear as well, which is what we started talking about last week. And we were in chapter 28. We did 1 through 14 last week. We're going to start at verse 15 this week. Let's begin. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 15. It says, You shall make a breastpiece of judgment, the work of a skillful workman, like the work of the ephod, you shall make it of gold, of blue, 
and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, you shall make it. Now it says it's a breast piece of judgment. So that tells us right away what it represents. It represents a judgment of God. Now what's a judgment? If a judge is sitting up on his, his platform and he's listened to the arguments and he's going to make a decision. When he makes that decision, when he pronounces guilty, not guilty, yes, no, whatever the decision is, that's his judgment. And so what this breast piece is, is it's literally a pronouncement in some way. It's a judgment from God. It says something. So just, just its name alone tells us that the breast piece represents something. It's symbolic. It's right there. It says it's, a ju- it's, it's of judgment. Now, verse 16, it's, it shall be square and folded double, a span in length and a span in width. The span is this, from the tip of my thumb to the tip of my uh, pinky. So roughly nine inches. And what this was, so about, right about here, and it was folded double, meaning that there was a pocket. So you had a front piece and a back piece. There was a pocket in between. That's what it looks like. Now it says, you shall mount on it four rows of stones. The first row shall be a row of ruby, topaz, and emerald. Now the Hebrew words here are somewhat unclear because... Hebrew is a very, very ancient language, and there were some things that were lost over time. We're not exactly sure what stone they're referring to. So in some ways, there was some guesswork being done, particularly when the King James Version was translated from the Masoretic text. Later, this is the New American Standard Bible. It's translated in large part from older copies than the Masoretic text. So there's still some ambiguity on what exactly these stones are. But when you look at Jewish tradition in the Talmud, when you look at the Jewish encyclopedia, when you look at uh, the Josephus' writings in the first century, and you look at the tradition from the tribes themselves, we can find out the colors of each of these stones. So whether or not we got the, uh, the stone exactly correct is not relevant because the color is. For example, in this case, it says ruby, topaz, and emerald. And we know that the tribe of Reuben was represented by the color red. Simeon was yellow and Levi was sky blue. Verse 18. And the second row was a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. And again, I don't really think it was actually a diamond. I think it was diamond color. And I'll tell you why later. But Issachar, the tribe of Issachar, was green. The tribe of Judah was a a dark stone with a kind of a fiery color in it. We're not really sure what it was. Zebulun was a clear stone. So diamond, quartz, something like that. Now the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. Amethyst is the one stone we're pretty darn sure of. Now Dan was turquoise in color. Naphtali was greenish gold. Gad was the, uh, the amethyst color. It's a, kind of a multicolored uh, stone. Verse 20. The fourth row, a beryl and an onyx and a jasper. The tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin was multicolored beryl. Asher was a cloudy white um, onyx. And the tribe of Joseph was a bright green jasper. And they shall be set in gold filigree. So they were set in a gold holder. It's kind of a square holder, and and that's what held them in place. The stones shall be according to the names of the sons of Israel. Twelve, according to their names, that shall be like the engravings of a seal, each according to his name for the twelve tribes. This is one of the reasons that many theologians don't think that the word diamond is correct here. It's probably uh, quartz or something like that, because how many of you know it's kind of hard to engrave anything on a diamond? All right, so, but it says that they had their names engraved here. Verse 22, you shall make on the breast piece chains of twisted cordage work in pure gold. You shall make on the breast piece two rings of gold, 
and shall put the two rings on the two ends of the breast piece. You shall put the two cords of gold on the two rings at the ends of the breast piece. You shall put the other two ends of the two cords on the two filigree settings and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod on the front of it. You shall make two rings of gold and shall place them on the two ends of the breast piece on the edge, which is toward the inner side of the ephod. And you shall make two rings of gold and put them on the bottom of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod on the front of it, close to the place where it is joined above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. You shall bind the breast piece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue cord so that it will be on the skillfully woven band of the ephod and that the breast piece shall not come loose from the ephod. So this is very, very intricate. It's very detailed. It's clearly very beautiful. That was its intent. And every color, every stone has a meaning. Now, there is a group in Israel today called the Temple Institute. Now, I've told you about these guys before. The Temple Institute, these are not Christians. They are Orthodox Jews. In fact, they're somewhat radical Orthodox Jews. The, tr- you know, the ultra-Orthodox Jews do not like the Temple people, the Temple Institute people. The uh, uh, more moderate Jews in Israel also don't like them because the Temple Institute is dedicated to rebuilding the Temple in the Temple Mount. How many of you know that's a little bit controversial? But they are so committed to it, they have trained more than 600 people from the tribe of Levi on how to do the, uh, the sacrifices. They're rebuilding everything. They're rebuilding all of the, the tongs. Everything that we're reading about here, they're rebuilding it. Well, here's their rebuilding of this breast piece here. And you can see from the picture, as soon as we get it up, there it is. Now, you'll notice the blue cord at the bottom, the gold rings that you were talking about. Notice how it's a pocket. It's got a top, and you, there's obviously a pocket behind there. And you can see the gold filigree around each of these stones. If you look closely, if we get a little closer, I, can, I don't think we can. But you can see the names of the tribes engraved into the stone, just like an engraver. You can see at the top where it's connected to the breast, I'm sorry, to the uh, shoulder pieces. You can also see the names of the tribes engraved up at the top. This is exactly what it would have looked like several thousand years ago because they're reconstructing it. You can see that the color of the breast piece is made out of linen and it's made with the blue and the scarlet and the purple. Now that's really, 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 really interesting here (coughs) is that while we are not sure exactly of the translation of each of the stones in terms of what was the stone exactly, Because we understand the colors, they were able to create what you see here. But one thing for sure, when I was looking in the Jewish encyclopedia to get some uh, more detail on this, I I ran across an interesting phrase. It pointed out that none of these stones, even though we're not exactly sure what they were, any stone you come up with that's red or it's turquoise or whatever, anything you come up with, was not native to the area where the people were at that time. So they could not go out and just pick them up off the ground. These came from somewhere. Every single one of them are imported. And all but a few, all but a few, are also not native to the land of Egypt. Remember, they came out of Egypt, and the people were just literally throwing gold and silver and gems at them. Leave town, please, after all the plagues. Remember that? We we're kind of a little bit past that, but don't forget it. So this was given to them. They had this in their possession. But none of these stones are native. They are all imported, which means that they were extremely valuable. They were costly. They were treasures, just like gold would be a treasure. Now, I, for one, think it is no mistake. Listen, I don't think it's a mistake 
that God had the names of his people engraved on the costliest, the most beautiful stones, and that these stones were right over the high priest's heart. I don't think that's a mistake at all. And remember what we said. This breast piece is a judgment from God. It's a pronouncement. It's something God has decided and declares. So this says something. And we need to understand what that something is. It has to do with the fact that the gems are costly and beautiful and precious and rare. It has to do with the fact that the names of the people of God are written there. It has to do with the colors, the blue, the red, and the scarlet. And when you connect all of those dots together, it all makes sense. Because the blue and the, the red and the scarlet, or blue, scarlet, and purple, they all represent Jesus. And who is Jesus to us now? Now, this is important because we're not Jewish. I mean, there might be a few of you in here that are Jewish, but for the most part, most of us are Gentile. We are grafted in to Israel. We don't replace Israel. We're grafted into it. And because of that, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, that Jesus is now our high priest. Look what it says. Hebrews 4, 14, it says, So then, we, Gentiles, non-Jewish people, we have a great high priest who has entered heaven. Who is that? Yeshua, Jesus, the Son of God. So let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest, Jesus, this high priest of ours, he understands our weaknesses. And he has faced all of the same testings, and temptations, and problems, and issues that you and I do. Yet he did not sin. So, because that's true, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Now he says, because this is true, let us come boldly. Now why, why would we be bold to come to God at all? Well, he's saying Jesus is our high priest. So you have to look back and understand the tabernacle to understand why it's a bold thing that you, particularly a Gentile you, would boldly come in front of the holy God. You would have to go all the way back to the tabernacle to understand it. That's what he's trying to say here, because Jesus is now our high priest. So let's think about the tabernacle, what we have learned so far. Let's look at the, the uh, outline, the cutaway, if you will, of the tabernacle. When you look at it, the courtyard and the outside, in the tabernacle, you see two chambers. Now, we've talked about this before, so this is a bit of a review, but we need to understand it because these two chambers illustrate they are the picture of what a relationship is between us and God. The holy place, the first part that you go into, you see the lampstand in there, and you also see the table of showbread. If you remember a few weeks ago, we explained the table of showbread. It was called in Hebrew, the bread of faces. It represents people. That's what it represents. We know this also because the priests would come in here and they would have a feast every week to, to change out the showbread. They would eat the bread, drink the wine, because in ancient times, when you made a contract with somebody, when you had a relationship with somebody, the way you did that, the way you facilitated it, the way you locked it in, was through a meal, a feast. That was the sign and the building of relationships. So this is where human beings are in relationship, but relationship with who? Well, with God. He's on the other side in the holiest of holy places. And inside the holy of holies, you find this, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark, we learned, even though God is present everywhere, God made, made it clear that his presence would be known in a very tangible, a very real, a very powerful way here in the ark between the two angels you see at the top, the cherubim. That the presence of God would be there in a very real way. But because God, listen, God is pure being. 
He has no beginning and no end. He is pure existence. You are contingent in your being. You started to exist at some point in time. You owe your existence to someone else. God owes his existence to no one. He is existence itself. And because of that, God is utterly pure. It's, imagine the purest of pure lights. Now, when we think about light, when it gets super pure, we call it a laser. It will burn you. And it's just light. I mean, this, this is light, but it's not as pure as a laser. A laser, it's so pure, it will literally burn you. It won't burn you because it doesn't like you. It will burn you because that's, it is what it is. See, God is utterly holy and utterly pure and absolute perfection. And because of that, his, his being would literally consume you because you and I are not holy like he is none of y'all are holy neither am i we've all lied cheated stolen thought evil things been selfish every single one of us and god is nothing like that and so this pictures how impure unholy human beings like you and i can have a relationship with the pure god how do you do that well, the ark where God's presence is, is in this holy place. It's behind a veil. The veil was what colors again? Blue, purple, scarlet, which we learned represents who? Jesus. So the relationship between man and God comes through the veil. Through the God-man. That's the only way you can have relationship between the, the human being who is imperfect and God who is perfect. In the, represented by the ark. Now, what's interesting here is not only was there this veil that was between the ark of the covenant and the people, but what's important about that is the blood that went on the ark. Why did they do that? Because once a year, the high priest would take blood and sprinkle it on top of the ark. Because God's presence is so perfect and pure that there needs to be a filter between the holiness of God and the imperfection of you and I. And so through the blood, God would meet with people. Through the blood, God would speak to people. So it was through the blood and through the veil. And that is a picture of Jesus. Hebrews tells us he's now our high priest. So what does that mean? That means that instead of coming in once a year and putting animal blood on the ark, Jesus now puts his own blood. He is the veil. That's why the physical veil was actually torn at the crucifixion in the temple. So now Jesus is the one that intercedes for you and for me with the holy God. When you're praying, the Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is the one that goes in, puts his own blood over, it's not the ark, he puts the blood over you actually, so that through him, through his blood, you can now have a relationship directly with the holy God. That's the picture. But as I was thinking about those pictures and I was thinking about those illustrations and I was thinking, well, this is review. We've learned this, but there's something else here. Aaron had, as the high priest, on his heart, these stones. And there's something else here. And I thought, Aaron takes the names of the people of God and puts them on his heart. And that's when it occurred to me, if Jesus is our high priest, then our names are on his heart. Amen. They're on his thinking. He represents your name over his heart in front of God. There is one mediator between God and man. Your name, your name on his heart. My name. The names of the people of God. Not only that, it's, these are beautiful, costly, precious stones. So that means that your name is to him a beautiful, costly, precious stone that's on his heart. Amen. When he was on the cross, 
He was thinking about you. That's pretty heavy. I mean, you and I may not feel like a rare or costly gem. We may not feel good about ourselves or that we're beautiful in any way. We may not feel, or worse, you hear God loves you and it's just three little words and it doesn't have any meaning. Because when you look at yourself, all you feel is your imperfections. All you see is, you don't look all that good to you. You feel worthless. But God doesn't see you this way. He simply does not see you this way. Now, you've got to remember that when God was giving these instructions to Moses on how to make this breastplate, he's saying, he's essentially saying to Moses, Moses, the people of God are so precious and so beautiful to me that I want them on Aaron's heart and his thought. And yet at the same time that God is explaining this, he knows what's happening down in the camp. Because remember, this is chapter 28. When we get to chapter 32, we find out that they're down in the camp making a golden calf to replace God. It's the ultimate betrayal, and yet God still sees them as this precious gem. And you've got to ask yourself how this could happen. Now, for me, personally, this came home to me some years ago. And the way it happened, you know, I, I can literally, I can count on one hand how many times I've had what you would call a mystical experience or a, a, a vision. Um, literally one hand. I mean, how many dreams I've had that I can honestly say that came from God. But one of them, I think, is appropriate to understanding this. Because it was very physical for me at the time. My ex-wife at the time had just left me. And her and her mother actually had made some anonymous telephone calls to my boss. And I lost my job. And I lost my reputation. I lost my house because they also called my... um, Uh, landlord. I lost my home. I lost everything. And I literally went back to San Diego at the time where my dad lived. Shattered. Absolutely shattered. I'd been lied about. I'd been cheated on. I'd been destroyed. I lost everything on my job, my home. I didn't, I, I had these three little kids. What am I supposed to do? It was a terrifying time in my life. I did not feel valuable at all. I had quote-unquote friends, and I use the term loosely, who told me that, well, since you're supposed to be the leader of your home, if your wife has left you, it must be your fault. Must be sin in your life. And heaped guilt And fear on me, I learned the hard way that Christians are really good at shooting their own wounded. And I I lost it all. Worse, what am I going to do to make a living? I grew up in the logging and the tree trimming business. So I went back to what I knew because that's what I knew. And I hate tree trimming with all of my heart. It's hot, miserable, nasty, ugly work. You look worse than three home, homeless people at the same time because you, you, you dress in this outfit and you're going to go crawling up a palm tree. It's 110 outside, which means that underneath those fronds, it's 150 degrees. And as you're crawling up underneath these palms, the pigeons have roosted in there for 20 years and the pigeon crap is that deep. And as you're cutting these things off, you're breathing all of that in. You're going to be hacking up black stuff for the next two days. It's horrible, miserable, nasty work. You get to the top of that palm tree, you're all wrapped in, you sawdust all over yourself, and you're just going, I hate this. Hated it. And I was filthy, 
people didn't like the look of me. I couldn't even go get lunch because you'd walk in the door and they're like, we re reserve the right to refuse service to somebody who looks like you. I mean, it was that bad. And then I have all of these personal problems going at the same time. It was absolute misery. And we were taking this liquid amber tree out in, we were in La Jolla. It doesn't, it doesn't get better when you're in the richest part of town, multi-million dollar homes, and they won't let you into the house to use the bathroom because you're one of the help. And that kind of helped too because you're filthy beyond words. It was not a good day at all. And I took my lunch, went to the back of the property, big ritzy mansion that we were working at, and there was this hill that went down overlooking the uh, north part of La Jolla Shores. So it's beautiful, ocean out there. And I'm sitting under this bush, and I'm just pleading with God. This is, I think, the worst day of my life. I mean, it was just, it was just horrible. And I'm crying my eyes out. And when you're crying your eyes out, you don't let the other tree trimmers know. So I'm all by myself. And I just, I, I told the Lord, I said, I got nothing. There is nothing about me or my life that could be in the least bit useful or attractive to you. I'm dirt and I'm covered with it. And I said, God, I don't deserve to go to heaven at all. And I know it. But if I have to dig underneath the walls of heaven by hand to get to you, that's what I'm going to do. I didn't feel any better, but that's what I said. Because I had to get up and go back and climb up a tree, which I did. That was a Saturday. The next morning, I went to church. I'm single now. I'm, what am I going to do? So I went to church. I actually went by myself because the kids were with grandparents. There's worship time going on. I couldn't even stand up. I'm sitting in the front row. I'm just, my head was like this on my hands. I was such a mess. It was a horrible day. <laughs> and right then, right in the middle of the song, this is the third time I've talked about it. I still can't say it. I had a vision. It was like watching a movie. It was so clear. It was like a little screen opened up. I could see it. And I saw myself on the side of that hill under that bush with my lunch. And I heard a voice was looking down at myself and this voice said, you belong to me. And the Holy Spirit came on me and I felt a love so great. I still can't talk much about it. It was so overwhelming. I literally had to say, enough. <laughs> it's more than I can take. And God, in the middle of my dirt, in the middle of the worst thing, said, that's not how you look to me, son. You belong to me. You're mine. Amen. And why does God want somebody as filthy as me? Because it's easy to forget when you're in that kind of a situation who God really is. It's easy to forget that God cannot lie. It's easy to forget that God swore by himself because there's no one higher to swear by that if you put your trust in him and devote yourself to him, he will wash your sins away. He cannot lie. But it's easy to forget that when you feel worthless. But the truth is, God simply does not change. There's no shadow of turning or darkness in him. He is constant. 
And when I mean constant, you have to understand that his nature pours out from him all the time. It's like a waterfall. When you look at a waterfall, it flows continuously over the top all the time. The waterfall does not change. But where you stand determines how wet you're going to get. Let me say that again. The waterfall doesn't change. You want to get wet? Depends on where you stand. You see, and God is like this. There's a part of his nature that flows over, maybe on the stuff on the left there. And that is the wrath of God. The anger and wrath of God is always against those who will rebel against him and hate him. It's always there. It never changes. It's forever. It's relentless. But maybe this other section here, that's the love of God. God will always, 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 always love those who will turn to him. Every time, I don't care how filthy you are. I don't care how much you've been under the wrath side. You're under the wrath, step over here. Because God's love never changes. God's correction never changes. For those of us that love him, we're standing under the love of God and we're dumb and we stand over here. Now we're under his correction and it's always going to be there. He's always going to fix you. You don't want to get fixed? Quit doing that. Step over here. Where you stand is what matters. He never changes. So how can God call you and I, these beautiful stones when we're such a mess in our own view? Well, it's because we don't understand, again, the nature of God. When, when you and I look at ourselves, we look at life, it's like this lady sitting here looking at a train. She's sitting in a chair, and the train, or he is, the train is coming this way. Now, the train on your right, you can see a little bit of the train. That's the future. You can see a little bit. We're going to go to lunch. We're going to do this. We can see a little bit. But as it comes in front of you, that's the present. When it passes you, it's now in the past. Okay, so you can see a little bit of the future and a little bit of the past, but mostly you see now. And because you only see now, you see the mistake you just made. You see that, well, I, I messed up for the 467 billionth time. It's right here in my face. And that's what you see. You see your flaws. You see your imperfections. You see yourself as undone. God sees you this way. He sees the whole of everything. Next slide. You're losing me, pal. There you go. All at once. See, God sees you in eternity. He sees the beginning and the end at the same time. So sure, he sees the beginning. You're a mess. He might even see the middle. You're a mess here too. But he sees the whole thing all at once. And from his perspective, you're already saved. You're already, your sins are already washed away. You've already got, you're already in heaven as far as he's concerned. And you see, God sees you as this beautiful, bright, gorgeous gemstone. He sees you as polished by the blood of Jesus. He sees you as this shining, magnificent, gorgeous, beautiful trophy of how awesome he is to make something so beautiful out of a knucklehead like you and me. That's what God sees. He's literally going to put you up on a shelf like a trophy and go, hey, angels, look what I did with this guy. Look what I did with this girl. Boy, was she a mess. Check it out now. Look what I did. My blood did this. And you're going to go, isn't he great? Look what he did with me. Trophies of his goodness and his beauty and his grace. He already sees it as done. And you're already on his heart. Done deal. And that... It doesn't give you just hope. It should put a spring in your step. There's a reason Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. 
It's already done. So there is no condemnation. There's none. So why are you condemning yourself? You're under his, when you're condemning yourself, you're under correction because he's going, uh-uh, fix that. Get under here under my grace. You don't deserve it, but it's never about you. <laughs> Get under there. Change your perspective. Gives us hope. And it gives us a future. And what a future it gives us. Look, Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. It says, to everyone who is victorious. What is victorious? Victorious means you understand that you may be a precious gem in his sight. But there is a devil, he doesn't like you. And there will be persecution in this life. But when you stick it out and you say, I am devoted to Jesus to my last breath. When that last breath comes, you are victorious. And in that moment, when you are victorious, he says, I will. How many of you know that when God cannot lie, he says, I will. He means it. I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each one a white stone. Now, this is gorgeous, a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. He will give you a stone, just you and him. It'll be this intimate moment in eternity, just you and God, just you. And he will give you a stone, and on that stone is your real name. Your real name. Every star in the universe has a name and God knows them all and not one is lost. Every human being who is devoted to him, he has a name for you. Your real name. In that intimate, beautiful moment, you will see how beautiful you are to him. And if you're that beautiful, if you're that done, if you're devoted to Jesus, that's who you are. If that's really true, how many of you know he's going to guide you? He's going to lead you. He will not forsake you. He'll help you get through this. We don't feel like it, especially when we're trying to go, well, should I turn left or should I turn right? And you don't know what you do, and you're praying about it. Well, what do you do? Well, let's, let's take a look at verse 30 to see what they did. It says, you shall put in the breast piece of judgment. That's in that pocket behind the, the, the stones. The Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. So we know that behind the breast piece was a pocket. It was a square pocket, about nine inches square. And there was something in there, the Urim and the Thummim. Now, we do not know what these two things are. We don't know. Some scholars, some theologians think that these were two stones. And there is some evidence that this is probably what they were one was white one was black they were put in there and basically the priest would be asking god about something and then he would just reach in the pocket and he'd pull out one of the stones could have been if it was white that means yes if it's black it means no that's some theologians think that i'm i'm iffy on that there are other theologians who believe that this was simply the judgments of god in other words this priest is going to understand what God is telling him because Urim and Thummim mean something. Let's take a look. The word Urim in Hebrew <coughs> means lights. But if you look at the Hebrew words there that I put up on the screen, on, Hebrew is read from right to left. On the right side, you see that looks like an X. That's Aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, Thummim means perfections. Put it up there. Thummim means perfections. And if you look at the Hebrew, the first letter in Thummim, or it's actually Tumim, is the letter Tav. Tav is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So Urim Thummim, first, last. Lights, perfection. Perfection means completion. So it's very possible that this wasn't two stones at all, but this was simply the beginning, the end, the judgment of God. The, the priest would be led by God to know what is the beginning, what is the end, what is the first, what is the last, what is the yes, what is the no. 
we're not exactly sure what these things were. But here's what we know for sure. We do know that the Urim and the Thummim were not magic sunglasses. Okay, just so you know, no magic sunglasses. You laugh about it, but there is a cult out there that believes that Joseph Smith had the Urim and the Thummim and he used them, put them in spectacles so that he could translate the Book of Mormon, magic sunglasses. That's not what this says. No magic sunglasses. All right? Now, we do know this. Whatever they were, now this is key, whatever they were, it was for the high priest at that time for those people in that place. It does not mean that you and I should be looking for some mystical thing whenever we're asking God whether we should turn left or turn right. For example, you're praying, you got this new job opportunity. It's come your way. It's really fantastic. They're going to pay you a lot of money, a little bit of travel involved, not too bad. And you're thinking, man, this, this is a great opportunity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be making good money. But should I do this or not? Should I say yes or no? And you're praying about it. And you're praying about it. And you go outside and you see a white bird fly by. And you go, ah, white bird must be yes. <laughs> you know, that's mystical nonsense. <laughs> mystical nonsense. So how do you decide? Well, there's four ways. The number one way that you and I decide today is through the Bible. That's your number one source of whether or not you should do it. So you're looking at this job, a little bit of travel, pays really well. To be a hitman for a cartel, yes. It, it, it pays a little bit of travel, not too much, pays real well. But how many of you know that contradicts what the Bible says? So you already know, you don't need white birds flying past, you already know, say no to said job opportunity. Does that make sense? All right. Now, so that's number one. Number two is get wise counsel. It does not, I'm not saying get counsel from your immature idiot friends. I'm saying wise, mature counsel. So go to the people you know will tell you what you don't want to hear. If your friend is a strong believer and you know that they're honest enough to look you right in the eye and say, don't do that, if th that's the person you want to talk to. <laughs> okay, so you're falling in love and you want to marry, but they're not a believer. What does the Bible say? No. What does wise godly counsel say? No. So why in the world are you saying yes? Third reason. Third reason. You got to look for the doors of opportunity. Amen. Now, sometimes that opportunity is right in front of you, but if that opportunity contradicts number one, don't do it. Pretty simple, right? Now, opportunity, like I said, that's why I put it as number three and not number one. Because sometimes you have opportunities. They're right in front of you. But it contradicts God's word in some way. But here's the kicker. Here's the big one, number four. Number four is the leading of the Holy Spirit in your own heart. Now, I know the Bible says that the heart of man is deceitful and wicked and who can know it. But it says that's the heart of the natural man. You've been regenerated by Christ. If you're, if you're a believer this morning, the Holy Spirit resides in you now. Your heart will tell you. You'll have an uneasiness. You'll go, something not right about that. And you're going, well, it contradicts the word. Wise counsel tells me not to do it. Okay, yeah, it might be an opportunity, but my heart's telling me no. Well, then no is your answer. Pretty simple, right? Okay, when we were trying to decide whether or not we were going to plant a church, plant a church. Now, that kind of comes backwards for me. It started, kind of went four to one. Because it's not like I had a scripture, you know, first hesitations, chapter four, verse six, Patrick and Melissa Marks will start a church in surprise in 2004. I did not have said scripture. Okay. Since I didn't have that, but I did have a leading in my heart. I just, it was a knowing, it was so powerful. It was almost annoyingly overwhelming. I knew that God wanted me to be in ministry. I knew it, but I didn't know where. Opportunities, 
couldn't really see. Uh, there were some possibles, but I just didn't know. And then I went to wise counsel. Well, I was talking to my dad. You know, I, I was talking to my pastors. Yeah, you should. But there was nothing in the, it wasn't contradicted in the word. But what, how do I add all this together? It was really, really a convoluted time. So I began to pray and I said, Lord, I really need to know if you want me to do this and where. Now, at the time, we were living in California, in San Diego. I was still surfing once a week, so this is a good place. You know, so I, there was no reason to move from there. I had a great job. The surf was good. You know what I mean? So why, why leave? <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no, no good reason. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, so I knew I wanted to be in ministry. And we even thought about starting our ministry in, up in Escondido, where I was at at the time. Again, because the surfing is good. And, you know, it was a good opportunity. It was all this. But there was something in my heart going, oh, this is just not the right place. So I'm praying about it. And we went to visit Melissa's parents who lived in Scottsdale at the time. And when we got here, my heart kept saying, you're near. It's like playing that game, warm, hot, cold. You know, I, mean, I just felt like this, this, there's, it's here, somewhere here. And I went, that can't be right. <laughs> the gates of hell are not far from here. I, in the summer, you can see them. I mean, uh, <laughs> heat comes out, you know. <laughs> it's like, I went, this can't be the right, the right place. So we went back to San Diego, but the, the sense of San Diego was not right. Something in Phoenix was, you need to be in ministry. And I'm like, this can't be right. I'm half Canadian. You're supposed to be sending me north. And so I, I just, it didn't work. But finally, I, I'm not sleeping at night now. I mean, that's, that's the Holy Spirit going <laughs> like this, you know. And I, so we came back, I came back out here by myself. You remember that? And, and, and I'm praying and fasting, and I hate fasting, so you know I'm serious. And so I'm, I'm out here doing that. And the first thing I did was borrow your guys' car. Remember this? And I drove to Flag because that's closer to Canada. No problem. You know what I mean? So... Maybe the Lord's calling me up there where it's, you know, nice and cool in the summer, you know. <laughs> Sense just wasn't there. Tried Williams, no. <laughs> Tried Prescott, no. Tried Prescott Valley, no. And I just, uh, it just sense. Drove down the hill. They lived in Scottsdale, keep that in mind. Drove down the hill, never heard of surprise. Cross Grand Avenue, and everything in my spirit went, this is the place. And I went, no, I can't be here at all. You know what I mean? I want to go back to Canada. You know what I mean? So it was like, no. But I said, all right, all right. If this is really you, I'll know with the whole job thing because I ain't moving without a job. So I, I'm a teacher, so I, I'm a high school teacher, high school marching band teacher. So I'm putting out resumes all over the place. Flagstaff, Williams, <laughs> you know, all these places. The only job offer I got was Surprise Elementary. I'm a high school teacher, Surprise Elementary School. Only job offer I got. Only one. And I went, oh, I guess we're going. And it was bad because when we moved in, it was July and it was 121 when we moved in. And I went, are you sure about this? I'm melting. Okay, but, but God is good. Taught me to love this place and all the people in it. And it has been nothing but blessings since we got here. Nothing. Because God knows he is smarter than me. I, I know what I wanted, but he's smarter than me. I may know what I want. He knows what I need. You see, John 16, 13 says this. But when he, the spirit of truth, that is the Holy Spirit, comes, he will guide you. He will guide you you he will guide you because you are on his heart because you are that precious jewel if you belong to him he will guide you just like he did for melissa and me he will guide you he will not speak on his own initiative but whatever he hears he will speak he will disclose to you what is to come and that my friend is the key and we'll close with this this is the key if and really key on that if if you are a devoted follower of Jesus. See, everything that I just said 
is for people who have devoted themselves to follow Jesus Christ. If you have not fully devoted yourself to Jesus Christ, nothing about what I just said applies to you. Because remember, the nature of God, like that waterfall. If you have not fully devoted yourself to him, you are under his wrath. Done. And it's forever and it never stops. People keep thinking, well, you know, I'm praying to God, but you're not fully devoted to him. That's like burning strange incense on his altar. You're, 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 you're praying. Well, who are you praying to? Well, I'm praying to God. No, you're not. You're praying to the ceiling, friend. Because if you have not devoted yourself to Jesus Christ, you don't belong to him, and nothing about what I just said applies to you. None of it. If you want it to apply to you, you need to be fully devoted to Jesus Christ. How do you do that? If you're not sure, you come talk to me, you come talk to Paul, you come talk to Melissa, you come to Jeanette. One of the, the believers here will lead you in how to do that. But if you are a devoted follower of Jesus, then you are precious. You are complete, right? And that means the Holy Spirit will guide you. And how will he guide you? Well, if you're practiced in his word, if you're patient in prayer and you're proactive to listening to wise counsel, he will guide you. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Father, we're a little bit over time We had communion, we had kids singing, we had a pastor who talks too much. You add all those things together, you're over time. But you know what? I didn't have it in my notes, first or second service. And in fact, in third, Lord, I was thinking I wasn't going to tell the story about you talking to me on that Sunday morning. But I got a strong sense that no, share the story again. And I'm glad I did because John 16 tells me you will lead me. You will guide me. You will tell me what to say. And so I did. And I pray and I hope that your word encouraged and built up your precious gems this morning. I pray that you help those who are devoted to you to walk out of this room feeling a little bit better about what you have done in their lives, what you're doing, that you see the end from the beginning, that you will guide us, that you'll direct us, that you will never leave us, never forsake us. And that if we're standing right now under your correction, we can always step back. It's just repent. Just repent. Just come to the Lord and say, I'm sorry I was doing that. I repent. I turn around and step right back underneath His grace. It's always there. It never changes. His love never changes. Help us to own that truth. Walk in the beauty and the power of it. Help us to worship you that much more because of the goodness of who you are. This, Father God, is what we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.